welcome to episode eight of the Power Score LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Kalorn, and I am in Las Vegas, Nevada. Yes, you are. You lucky jerk. Uh, this is John Denning. I am in Los Angeles, California. Not as good of a loss. <laughs> yeah, that's the second best loss. Uh, <laughs> tell me about Vegas. Explain uh, yourself. Vegas is Vegas. It's always here. It's always on. It's always <laughs> bright. But why are you there? I'm here for the NCAA tournament, of course. I know. I knew the answer to that, but now everyone else can be jealous with me. You having a good time? Um, I'm going to be having a better time. I just actually got here yeah. relatively uh, recently. So right now, the uh, the first games of the tournament are actually starting, but it's the Tuesday game. So mm. they're not okay. that exciting to watch Fairleigh Dickinson and <laughs> Prairie View A&M battle it out. <laughs> you say so. Uh, I know you've been there at least long enough to open a cocktail and by open. What are you drinking? I am drinking a Guinness in honor of St. Patrick's Day. That's right, man. Happy belated St. Pat's. Yes. Which I was excellent. Have... What a great holiday that is. One oh, of my favorites. I know. Well, for good reason for both of us. I had a few Guinness left over from the weekend, too. So cheers. I'm drinking one as well. Good call. Uh, why are you such a big fan of St. Pat's? Again, I know the answer, but for anyone else. Because <laughs> I'm Irish. Because you're Irish. <laughs> That's the easy answer. <laughs> As am I, but I think you've got a, a greater claim to the heritage than I do because you've actually got some namesakes back in Ireland proper. I do. There is actually a town of Killorn in Ireland, so it's kind of cool. Very cool. A pub there somewhere too, right? Yes, but that's not in Killorn. I mean, there's pubs there, but that's oh, yeah. in uh, Tupperkur. There's a Killorn pub. And there's, so. there's pubs everywhere. Pubs in the woods. That's the only one I can get free drinks at, though. That's ridiculous. It's that you left there, awesome. I mean, that you <laughs> didn't just immediately put up camp. That my people uh, left there years ago. People left. I know. I'm a little more English and I think Scottish than Irish, but I've got enough of a claim to it. And you and I have both toured that island a few times. So oh, yeah. If anybody As, uh, wants yeah, Ireland tour guide tips. I'm happy to go along. And I've actually been in Dublin a number of times, including on St. Patrick's Day. And that's uh, a bit of fun. So just a bit. highly recommend it. <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, they know what they're doing over there. Come on, a national drinking holiday? I'm oh, all for man. it. Yeah. Well, I'm anyway. glad we've imported it. Uh, yes. <laughs> let's talk about the song. What are we listening to tonight in honor of the theme? The theme tonight is outliers uh mostly logical reason that we're going to talk about and so the episode title is lr outliers the black sheep and the convoluted story here is the song is actually called black sheep but it is by kind of a band they're called the clash at demon head and they are the centerpiece band in a movie called scott pilgrim versus the world and the tie-in here, aside from the black sheep, is that in the movie, Brie Larson plays uh, Scott's ex-girlfriend, and she actually sings the main track here. And it's a song by Metric that she re-recorded and actually did the vocals on, and she kills it. So that's her vocals? It is her vocals. Oh, I'll be damned. How and about that? Uh, the actual lead singer of Metric, Emily Haynes, said she did a very different version than I did, but I really like her version, too. And so since we got Captain Marvel as the number one movie and we got Black Sheep, it all kind of comes together perfectly. Yeah, and then there's Brie. Brie Larson in the middle of it. And I'm yeah. for that as well. well. Brie can do anything, it turns out. Apparently so. That is impressive. It's a actually it's a pretty killer song, but I figured she was lip syncing. No. Good for her. In That's fact, her a cool whole... song. We'll link it in the uh, we'll link the video. Actually, it's a great movie, too, for any Edgar Wright fans or even if yeah. you're not an Edgar Wright fan, I think it could turn you to one. Well, the interesting thing, too, is, is they modeled her performance on the lead singer of Metric. So then when they were able to actually use a Metric song, is kind of that's like the centerpiece of the movie in some respects. Right. Uh, they were, Everybody was stoked. It was like it all came together in one of those perfect artistic visions that everybody gets excited about. <laughs> it's a very weird movie, but I dig it. It's totally weird. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the vegan power part. And then it turns out he's not a vegan and he loses his V card. <laughs> well, so. The weirdest part might just be the thought of Michael Sarah beating people up. Maybe so. But there you have it. He's uh, not my favorite actor, but I, he's eh. livable in that. That's hard to beat Arrested Development. Um, tell me a little more about March Madness. Obviously, it's kicking off here in Vegas. It is kicking off. I and know who you're rooting for. You think? <laughs> Being That's a great Duke mystery. grad, obviously, I'm rooting for Duke, and they are one of the biggest favorites in uh, 
in years, actually. I think it's like seven or eight years since they've had a, a favorite with the odds this uh, this much in their favor. So I think that's kind of cool. It's not. I don't think I'm going to be here all three weeks. And honestly, I'm kidding there. I'm only I'm only here through the weekend, <laughs> and then I'm out of here. Uh, but I'm hoping they can take it all away and grab another title, which would uh, equal us with Carolina, which would be very cool. That would be, be very cool. And, you know, it's not like Duke ever lets you down, so I'm sure – I'm sure you can stay optimistic. Yeah, they never let me down. <laughs> Lehigh, Mercer, yeah, these yeah, games. Yeah, yeah. yeah, whatever. I'm a long-standing Duke fan, which means that the history is both great and at times terrible. But checkered, hard checkered. to complain if you're a Duke fan. Things have been pretty, pretty good for us. <laughs> well, while we're talking house cleaning and checkered behavior, um, the admissions scandal continues to roll along. If you guys aren't familiar with this, we've talked about it in a few episodes, but this is um, the FBI investigation, the Department of Justice investigation, Operation Varsity Blues, which I still love, Great uh, movie. that has uncovered a tremendous amount of, not quite backdoor, what did he call it? Side door? Is that what he called it? That's what uh, Mr. Singer called it, Mr. Side Singer. Door. Yeah, Singer being the, the main operative in this, getting a lot of relatively high profiles people's kids into schools that they didn't deserve to go through, through high bribery payments, um, cheating on exams, photoshopping them as athletes when they weren't to get them onto a quote unquote sports team at the school. A lot of really nefarious behavior. Yeah, and as good as things have been going for Duke, they have not been going well for the people involved in this scandal. Uh, no. Which is justice. I mean, this is justice being served on people who were trying to game the system and cheat the system. In yeah, so Duke many deserves ways. a number one, and a lot of these people deserve jail time, frankly. I think so. I don't know whether some of these actors and CEO types are going to get jail time. I think some of the, you know, the penalties will really vary depending upon how far they went, but it wouldn't bother me if they did. And at the least, I hope they get fined massive, massive amounts for this. Why not pay back the government for all the time they had to spend figuring this out and then prosecuting it? You know, it wouldn't bother me if somebody like Lori Laughlin and her husband were just hit with a $20 million fine. Mm. Now, I don't think it's going to happen, but they're already paying a price because I know that she's been dropped by Hallmark. She's been dropped by Fuller House. Mm -hmm. uh, her daughter, her eldest daughter, Olivia Jade, uh, who's a big YouTube sensation, already dropped out of school and has lost a number of uh, endorsement deals. Right. Like Sephora dropped her and dropped a little line that she was starting. So, uh, you know, penalties are being paid, but at the same time, they should be paid. That's just yeah. the bottom line here. Yeah, penalties have been earned at this point. Um, her other daughter dropped out of USC as well, I think, right? Yeah, Lachlan they both... or Laughlin? I think it's Locke. Yeah, you know, I think last week we said Laughlin, but I keep hearing Lachlan, and I, I guess that is the Scottish kind of pronunciation. It could be. Well, she's got that Scottish sense of humor about it all because she keeps joking <laughs> about how, how expensive her daughter's education is and how she's really not getting her money's worth. Well, it's gotten a lot more expensive. So Yes, it's going to. We'll have to see. She's she's doing court in 10 days in Boston, so I'll be very interested to see what happens to Aunt Becky. Yeah, I think, oh, poor Aunt Becky. I think one of the things I saw was a video of her sitting next to Olivia Jade, and Olivia Jade made some comment about London being her favorite country. And you could just see defeat in Lachlan's eyes. She said that she'd overpaid for this girl's education. She had. She should have been uh, there. That's right. So, that's right. But I think that's based on the song, by the way, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, it could be. We'll have to um, see. This isn't done. There's going to be more to this. For sure. I know that USC has placed on hold all the applications that are related to this that were in the current pool. I know a bunch of coaches have lost their jobs. Uh, aside from like actors losing endorsement deals and, and acting gigs, you see all sorts of people who are like lawyers and CEOs being placed on administrative leave or being dropped. So Dropped by their firms. I've seen that from a few lawyers involved in this. Uh, the curious thing for me at this point is twofold. Number one, how much more is going to come out? Because this has been going on now for about eight years, as I understand it. Yeah. I don't think they would scratch the surface. No, but the problem is, can they prove it? Right. And I don't know if they can. They, If you read the complaint uh, that was released online, and I'm not sure I'd even recommend it. It's like 170 pages or something. It becomes the same old thing where the FBI is just documenting that these people were evading uh, the law and, and trying to act as if these were charitable donations. And that was really one of yeah. the main ways they got them. So, Which leads to my second curiosity. How are they going to treat these kids? Because some of them clearly didn't know, but some of them did. Yeah. It's pretty obvious now that some knew for sure. It was a little unclear last week, uh, and it was quite 
it was known that in some instances the parents went out of their way to hide it from their child and actively suppressed anything that might have tipped them off. However, I'm now hearing reports that in some cases the students never filled out any part of their application <laughs> or that they got admissions letters that said, welcome to USC, we look forward to you being a big part of the crew team. And hey, that's a great letter to get. Yeah. But if you're reading it and you're a student, you're like, the crew team? Yeah, I can't <laughs> uh, even swim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've never rowed. I don't know what this is about. What oh, is it's crew? just a mistake, honey. I don't uh, think yeah, so. I think there was an article that came out yesterday, in fact, from USA Today, that talked a lot about just how much some of these students knew. Shined a light on some of this. Some knew. And in one instance, I think a mom and her daughter were joking afterwards about the cheating that had gone on. Because a proctor, the proctor in question, who caused a lot of the issues, sat there and told her what the right answers were while she was taking the test. And then afterwards, they joked about cheating the system. I'm like, yeah, I think at this point, you're probably in a lot of trouble. Yeah. So as we turn an eye more towards the LSAT, let me close with this. Don't cheat. It never goes as well as you might hope. And in the case of LSAT, it's only going to come back to hurt you tenfold, because it's not just that you have to drop out of school. It prevents you from actually pursuing that as a career path. You're Olivia done. Jade's going to survive this. Um, right, because she's going to go do another YouTube video. Something. So I get it. And she'll bounce back from this. And probably even Lori Lockham will bounce back from it, too. It might be eight, ten years, but you see this happen far too frequently. Anyway, let's move on to the LSAT world, exactly. where cheating is not advisable at all. <laughs> <laughs> There's not actually a whole lot going on. This Doubly week. ill-advised, yeah. Yeah, so they put out a new blog of their law colon fully blog, uh, but it was another story about kind of like first generation, and it's they've chosen a very interesting selection of people. You know, obviously you've, you've got a bunch of students. This time they actually went in house and they used their deputy for legal and global higher education. So I think it's an interesting story, just like they all are interesting. I will say this much. She mentions in the article that uh, about her experience in law school, she entered law school with two children. That already sounds like impossibly difficult. And then she had a third child, I believe, in her second year of law school. At NYU. Child. Yeah. yeah. And it was NYU Law School, so it was, you know, it's rigorous. And so she's three children, and the third one, I think, had some uh, problems. And so they were in a neonatal uh, care unit. So she had to go in and see the child every day for a month. I can't even imagine trying to do this with three kids. I, when I read that, I was like, that's pretty impressive. It's incredible, man. This is uh, Camilla DiGiorno, their deputy for legal and global higher education. And I say, without hesitation, Camilla DiGiorno is a badass, man. <laughs> that is incredible that she was able to do that. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I have one child and no <laughs> law school to deal with currently. And I feel sometimes it's overwhelming. So. It's all we can do to break away for a podcast. Uh, I yeah, can't exactly. imagine. NYU. Yeah. Well, a child and a dog. And <laughs> those two add up pretty quickly. So. I'm my only responsibility, and even I have struggle. So, you're very irresponsible. Too. Thank you, buddy. I'm a lot to keep a hold of, to be you sure. You don't do a very good myself. job of keeping a hold of yourself. Well, thanks, man. <laughs> the Appreciate other thing it. I'll, I'll mention, it. since it's such a light week in the uh, the world of LSAT, <laughs> is keep in mind that if you are now that we're starting to see a lot of applications go through, and they, and they're updating numbers constantly. You can research the daily updates in their data section, which we'll link as well. And you can learn a ton of facts by examining what's happening in the changes. Here's a good example of one. Currently uh, in the US, scores in the 175 to 180 range are down 21% this year. Last year, there was 686. This year, there's 538. Although if you look inside those numbers, you see some real odd things. I think like 178 is up 21%. But or around 20 percent and the others are way down it's a very odd kind of like jumble but it's the kind of thing where if you're looking at it and you're applying and you're trying to figure out where you stand and, and the competitiveness of the market whether you're at 150 160 170 whatever that's a great place to go and actually look around yeah one more article that we can link down in the uh, in the notes here too Indeed. But that's it for the week in the LSAT world. It is slow right now because kind of we slow know the, one. the calm before the storm. That is right. The March storm <laughs> is coming. Well, let's talk more about March because, again, this is the main focus of tonight. It's been really the main focus of the last couple of episodes. Um, 
to greater and lesser extents. But what we've mostly discussed up to this point in leading people to their March test date has been a prioritization of sorts. How do you know what to focus on? How do you study? How do you review? What's the right way to take practice tests? And what are the issues or concepts that are going to play the most significant role in your outcome here in March? And we've done a few episodes on these various pieces, um, talking, again, even down into the individual concepts that flaw and assumption, strengthen, um, must be true, that these are the big LR types. And even within those features that you're likely to see in recent trends. We're going to break away from that in a pretty severe way tonight. This is going to be a very different tact that we're going to take because we're reaching now the final stages where you can start to explore the outer boundaries, the periphery, or as we titled the episode, the black sheep of sorts, really in every section. Although, Dave, I think you probably agree, reading comp tends not to have <laughs> quite as many outliers. Not, not so many. There's a few question types that you, you don't see a whole lot of, like the expansion question, where they right. say, okay, what would be the next paragraph, that kind of thing, or how, what would you title this? The, you, you see some rare types of questions, but there's sure. not nearly as many. It's so much based on must be true. Mm -hmm. Like, well, if you focus on that idea, whether it's detailed or broad, you're usually in pretty good shape as far as like questions and so forth. Right. And of course, passage topics tend to fall into pretty well-defined categories too. You're going to see a bunch of humanities, some science, some law, just count on that. But when you get into games and particularly when you get into logical reasoning, that's where these outliers can make a big difference when you encounter them. We're going to focus tonight on logical reasoning, but before we do, I think we should at least briefly talk about the, to me, the big three outlier game types that people should at least be aware of and probably spend a little time over the next 10 or so days exploring. Familiarizing. Not, yeah, that's Let's exactly that right. Term. It's a better word. Speaking this is not a deep dive, a but you word. do need to be aware of these <laughs> things so you can react appropriately in the odd chance or off chance that you hit them. Let's talk about those game types first quickly. You want me to do it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> as I see it, uh, and as Dave has actually nicely presented in a previous episode, almost everything that occurs on this test, 95 plus percent, I think recently it's been more like 97, 98 percent of the games are going to fall neatly into linear or grouping or some combination of those two concepts, whether that's basic or advanced linear or sequencing on that side, or just the typical type of grouping with numerical distributions, well-identified or less so identified variable sets. Almost everything that you're going to see is going to fit into that. So you got to be good at that. If you're not good at these things yet, Take what I'm about to say with a boulder of salt, put it well aside until literally like as close to test day as possible. Focus on those big ideas. But once you feel like you've got those pretty well in hand, there are three game types that do still exist. And that if you do encounter them, you're going to want to be familiar, to steal Dave's word. And they are pattern games, mapping games, and circular games. I don't give those in any particular order. That's just the way they popped into my brain just now. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll actually put a link to each of those three types of games and every single instance of their appearance since 1991 through the present. We'll put that down in the notes. So if you do want to go explore mapping or pattern or circular, you'll know exactly where you can find instances of it. If I had to prioritize those, and Dave, you're welcome to disagree, I would go pattern first, then totally. circular, then mapping. I would too. Okay. Um, Although, you know, circular and mapping probably really similar, both lower than pattern by a marked amount, just because there was that circular game on the July 2018 LSAT, mapping of. itself isn't that common as a whole. Yeah. Although that July 2018 game was really a 2014 game. So exactly. even that's kind of a false um, frequency or false recency. If they were smart, they would update some of those old mapping games from the early 90s because there were some real tough ones in there. The one about the five islands, of, I think it's 1992, is a yeah. really rough game that confused a lot of people. They could update that and toss it out, and I feel like 98% of the population would have no really comfortable way of attacking it. There, oh, yeah. There is a way Ski to attack chalets, it. chalets, things like that, people to instantly yeah. implode. And that's the point, that there's no thing, there's nothing banning LSAC from dusting these off and, and redoing them. We saw this in 2000, was it 2014, June 2014, when the first pattern game made a reemergence. Yep. And people were floored by it in the worst way. There's nothing that says LSAC can't put a circular game or a mapping game on the upcoming test, especially if they start to reuse an older test, maybe internationally, that we haven't heard about, which we've talked about, or an old Sabbath test that didn't get a lot of attention. This could be like under our noses the whole time and suddenly it reappears. 
Yeah, let me make a comment about that Ski Chalets game. That mm-hmm. was on the February 1992 LSAT. And the exact formation is not going to happen again. It's too clear and identifiable. Anyone who's ever seen that game would know how to solve it in Agreed. the future. They'd have to reconfigure it somehow. You know, maybe more chalets or nodules, as, as the case might be in that game. Maybe in a different uh, type of order as opposed to two rows of three. Right. They'd have to flip it around. So if you go back and you look at these older games, whether it is pattern or mapping or what have you, think to yourself, well, what changes could they make to this that would make it harder for me to identify? That's part of what the value is here is thinking about this proactively and considering, all right, I'm, I'm probably not going to see this exact game again, very unlikely, but maybe I'm going to see a variation on it, which is much more likely. Yeah, that's a really good point. A lot of people approach those old games from a memorization standpoint. And that's useful, but it really doesn't paint the full picture. No, it doesn't. And it's, it's more an exercise in just keeping your mind nimble and agile and ready to go, depending upon what you see on test day. It's not as if you're going to accurately predict, oh, they're going to redo this game and it's going to look like this. That's not the point of the exercise. So don't get frustrated if you're like, right. I don't know what they're going to do. Instead, think about it as, well, what if I flip this over here? What if I change this rule? Think about how you could interact with the game mentally in order to see how you might have to react if it was changed during a real live fire situation. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, we talked about this back when we were doing some other discussions of question types. When we talked about like parallel questions give you a great opportunity to explore things in other directions. What would this answer have looked like to be parallel somewhere else? And I think games really allow that too. To a much greater degree than most people um, tend to take advantage of. Agreed. Cool. So you'll see this too if you look at the list of games that we're going to put out. It is heavily stacked and tilted back to the 90s um, to test 20 plus years ago. But there are a few instances, especially of pattern that have occurred more recently, which is why we say put that game at the top of your outlier list. And also, yeah. just you know, to add to that point, think about the best way to test somebody if you are LSAC. Is it to give you pattern game after pattern game and then on the next test give you another one? No, because then everybody's right. like hyped and ready for a pattern game. The better thing to do is to only throw it out there once in a blue moon and that way you keep people completely off guard. Yeah. And so if it does pop up, everybody freaks out a little bit. A lot of times people don't know how to deal with it. When that circular game came up in July of 2018, even though we had said we think there's a good chance there's a circular game on this test, there were students afterwards that I saw in various discussion forums who were like, I didn't know how to attack it. Yeah. And I was like, well, it's in the LGB, so <laughs> that's the first place to start. We teach it in all of our courses. But the truth is, is that not every LSAT book covers it. There are fairly yeah, well-known, too. well-known books out there that don't even talk about circularity. And I'm like... To me, that bothers me because I'm like, it's part of the test. It shows up with enough frequency that you at least want to know how to attack it. Yeah, there's enough potential of it. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to do 100 examples of it, but do couples so you're like, all right, I understand the basics of it and it won't blow me away when I run into it. Precisely. Yeah, on the off chance I do. And if I'm a reasonably accomplished test taker, these are the moments I hope for. I hope there's a mapping game on my test or a pattern game or something that other people in the room aren't going to react to as well as I can. These yeah. are chances to really set yourself apart to get some distance between you and the competition. Yeah, I'd like the weirdest test possible, please. Please, with the <laughs> softest curve possible. Give me that. Give me the hardest questions in the weirdest fashion. That's, <laughs> you know, honestly, for a lot of really good test takers, that's the the, the kind of like the, the, dream the peak day. experience. Yeah. yeah. That's the Everest that they really want to climb. Yeah. So. My LSAT lottery, when I hit it, it's like two circular games, a mapping, and then some nonsense that no <laughs> one's ever seen. Give me that. And a minus 16 curve. That would be nice, huh? That would be. It's not going to happen, but these games have enough of a chance of happening that you need to be familiar with them. Um, so, again, if you're still struggling with the fundamentals, don't worry about this stuff. But once you feel like you're reasonably accomplished, these are the final holes to fill. These are the final gaps to close. Agreed. And then you're covered for anything. And the same holds true for logical reasoning, which is going to be where we spend the majority of this discussion, and really the rest of it. Um, And there's two question types, as I see it, that stand alone in their obscurity or in their infrequency. There's some others that appear infrequently, but with enough regularity that you should already be familiar with them. The two question types we're going to talk about tonight, you can go two or three tests in a row and not sing a single one of. 
Uh, and the first of those types, to just launch right into this, is a question type called cannot be true. Cannot be true questions, I think statistically over time, have appeared about one and a half times per test, maybe 1.3, somewhere in that range. So you're probably going to see one. You might see two, but there are plenty of tests out there, including the June 2007 test, which is the free LSAT, including the September 2014 test, which is the one that LSAC gives for free through their familiar.org or whatever software. Neither of those tests have a single cannot question on them. No, and, and let me at least clarify that we're talking about logical reasoning. Yes. You will see cannot be true questions in logic games. So this discussion kind of works along with that as well. But we're focusing now on logical reasoning. And in the LR section, something like cannot just is a very rare thing that you're going to run into. And I always ask this question in classes when I teach them, like, why do they do that? <laughs> Why do they have question types that they only use once in a blue moon? Uh, whereas they have other question types where you just see tests that are full of them. Yeah, you know, 8, like, 9, 10 a test. Yeah, must be true nine times on a test. And then there's cannot be true, which is very closely related to must be true. And it might not appear for a couple tests in a row. What's their point in doing that? And, you know, there's usually some various answers. But <laughs> the gist of it is to keep you off balance. I've often said that if you gave students a test that was 25 weekend LR questions in a row, they would really start to sink into a, um, a pattern where they became very machine-like, another yeah. weekend question. They just crush it. One you get a groove and a rhythm. Very much so. But by using different question types, what are they doing? They're throwing you out of that rhythm. And that's very dangerous because if you're getting knocked off that kind of like that smooth track that you're supposed to be on, you've got to stop, you've got to readjust, and then you have to try to work through the question and you're not comfortable. This is why we talk about preparation and the idea that, hey, at least know what you want to do, know what they are asking of you, so that when you do encounter it, it's not a shock to the system and you're able to respond in a very calm, uh, adroit manner. So... Perfect. I'm, I'm <laughs> chuckling over here because I, I flashed to this John Mulaney stand-up bit. And if you don't know who John Mulaney is, he's great. Called Street Smarts. It's in his latest special. And his big thing about Street Smarts was trying to throw them off their rhythm. But that's exactly what LSAC is trying to do here. Sure. Um, usually when I ask that question in class, like, guys, why do you think that they stagger so much the frequency of different question types? What I usually get back is just people calling LSAC a bunch of names. <laughs> Isn't unfair, um, but again, they, they do it so that you can't find this like consistent groove yeah, to get this into. Is, this is their job, and they do it well. Yeah, our job is to to be prepared for it. You have to do as good a job as you possibly can with that. For sure, it's just, it's just a battle. It's age old at this point with test makers and test takers. And let's be honest too. I mean, there are certain things that they they on their end I think value more highly or prioritize more as a skill. Um, must be true, the ability to prove things. Clearly, they value more highly than the ability to disprove things, sure. which is why you see this enormous discrepancy between must and cannot. But as Dave said, must and cannot are very closely related. In fact, I think one way to describe these questions that's quite accurate is just as a polar opposite of must be true. Yeah. So the you often complete get, polar yeah, opposite, not total. just the opposite. Right. Not a logical opposite, a polar opposite. Yeah, so all the way around, instead of proving something is the case, you're actually proving that it cannot be the case. That's so right. Yeah. You're not going north, you're going south. <laughs> right. Yeah, to consider this on like a finite number line from zero to 100, if must is the 9900, cannot is the zero. Yeah. It's everything else that lives in between that would be logical opposites, really kind of a both almost. Um, exclusive. But what that means is a lot of times you get stimuli here for cannot be true questions that are identical to what you would see with must be true. There's a lot of conditionality oftentimes. There's very rarely a conclusion or an argument that you'll see in these stimuli. Straight facts at. Mm -hmm. Very much premise set or fact set that you see. But the task at hand really does function exactly opposite. If you can make something true, you should be able to, with that same set of information, that same set of facts, to make something false. Um, Dave, you've described this, and I'm going to actually let you expand on it if you're willing to, uh, in a way that I actually think is really insightful but different than just a polar opposite must be true, which is the most obvious. You've called this a reverse weaken type of question. And it kind of is, if you think about it. I mean, in a weakened question, you use one of the five answer choices to attack some part of the stimulus. 
And in this case, they flip it upside down. They use the stimulus to attack one of the five answer choices. So the weakened idea is still there, but instead of it going from answer choice to stimulus, it now goes in reverse from stimulus down to the answer choices. And that's usually how I think about these because I like the active nature of that description. Yeah, me too. You're doing something. Sometimes when you look at these questions, it's really easy to think about them in a passive way. Oh, I just have to find something that contradicts it. Right. That is, you're not really being very active there. You're not doing a whole lot. You're kind of sitting back and waiting. Whereas if you think about, I'm using this information and the stimulus to attack an answer, that to me is much more engaged and puts you in a position of really thinking about what's happening as opposed to just observing it and not really being that involved in it. Yeah, I love that. I explain this to students a lot, that it's really easy in these questions, I think, to resign yourself to an absence in an answer choice. Also, oh, because the stimulus happens, something else won't. But it's a far more powerful active agent. With this information, the stimulus is true, it's going to disallow one of these answers. It's going to actively seek to remove or eliminate it. That's really how this kind of works. Eliminate in the sense that what the answer says is not compatible. Yeah, it's an that's, impossible that, coexistence. That idea by itself is actually a really important one because you're talking about the idea of consistent and inconsistent information. And that is a whole other discussion, but I think we should get into it just a little <laughs> yeah, bit. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, because, Do you want to talk before we do about how to actually spot these questions? No. Okay. I want to I want to flow this from the consistent could be true idea Let's straight on into it. Although I just tipped you did. <laughs> my hand slightly, but that's okay. That's all right. So when you are talking about consistency and inconsistency, mm -hmm. a lot of times what I like to say to students is, "All right, I'm going to give you two statements. Are they consistent or inconsistent?" And the statement I always used was uh, all flowers are yellow. Okay, that's statement number one. All flowers are yellow. And statement number two is this house is purple. Are those consistent or inconsistent? Now, in classes, what typically <laughs> would happen is the majority of people would say that those two statements are inconsistent because they, they don't relate to each other at all, and so they don't agree. But that's wrong. Those two statements are consistent with each other. And it's because they actually don't disagree with, the, with, with right. each other. The idea of what is consistent is what could be true, what is possible. So if two things can coexist in a world, even if they're completely unrelated to each other, they right. are automatically consistent. Now, if I say all flowers are yellow, and my second statement is this flower is purple. Right. These two statements are inconsistent because they actively disagree with each other. And so when we talk about consistency, an inconsistent statement is one that cannot be true based on the other statement. Yeah, Whereas diametrically opposed. That's diametrically right. opposed. They will contradict in an active sense. Whereas consistency is just could be true. Right. And so if you keep that in mind, what that means is when you look at cannot be true questions, you're going to have four answers that could be true or even must be true. Those are all wrong. And you're going to have one answer choice that is absolutely knocked out. And that cannot be the case. And this is what you see in the question stem presentations that reflects that. Yeah. Because they have a couple different ways that they introduce this. They can say just directly to you, which of the following cannot be true then you're looking again, that inconsistent, that active right. disagreement. They could say each of the following could be true, except. <laughs> so four of them could be true. And then that remaining answer is the opposite of could be true, which is once again, cannot be true. Right. Or they will say, which of the following must be false. And you notice that you actually see all these presentations in logic games as well. Yeah. Although the second of those, or the second and third of those, I'd say the most common, could be true except and must be false. Yeah. Tend to be more common in logic games. And in logic games, if I see those kinds of question stems, I will highlight the except or I will highlight the false because I don't want to miss that. And it's a it's such a pivotal term. Yeah. Flips when you say highlight, you mean circle or underline, right? Well, in the paper LSAT, I'll underline it. In the digital LSAT, I'll highlight it. Fair enough. Way ahead of you, bro. No, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm months um, ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, you're four months ahead That's of me amazing. at this point. Anyway, so you <laughs> see that the question stem is telling you, don't just find an answer that's possibly the case or that can coexist. Find an answer choice that is against the information. Yeah. 
So we use these words like consistency. Dave, you've used the word coexistence a few times. You could think of this as compatibility is another word. All of these essentially get to the same thing. Can these two live simultaneously or does one essentially deny the existence of the other, make the other die or impossible? That's exactly the case. Perfect. Well, since we've got this kind of floating around, and that's a good example you gave, let's explore some more examples. Yeah, let's take a look at one and okay. then uh, kind of walk through it. Let's use a conditional example. Let's say that you <laughs> had a statement that you received in the stimulus that said... Make it topical. It, you want it to yeah. Make it okay. topical. I was going to use lawyers, but nah. uh, if you are an actor, <laughs> then you are honest. Nice. Fantastic. Is that topical enough That's for you? beautiful. <laughs> if you are an actor, then you are honest. So let's say that was the entirety of your stimulus, <laughs> in which case it's a good day on the LSAT because that's a nice short stimulus. Yeah, good so luck. if you're an actor, then you are honest. What kind of statements are possible under that scenario? What could be true? What are the wrong answers? And then what kind of statements would be correct that cannot be the case? So... Um, let's start with the cannot be true because it's easier to take a statement and contradict it. You have mm -hmm. to go directly against it. And usually that's a finite number of statements. If you look at the could be true statements, there's, oh, they're how, endless. How much time have you got? Yeah. Well, you don't have enough time because you can just <laughs> keep on going on and on and on, you know, all trees are green. Okay. That could be true and is that's, therefore incorrect here. It's compatible. It's consistent with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I want to make more jokes about actors, but I'm not going to. <laughs> well, if you are an actor, then you are charitable. If you are an actor, then you are. You could do this all day charitable. long. Charitable, nicely played there. Thanks. <laughs> that could uh, be true. It could be true, and we know that many actors are. However, the actors in the admission scandal claim to be charitable when in fact there was a lot of not. charity in that. Well, yeah, that's part of the reason they're under indictment. <laughs> Allegedly. Allegedly. But think about this. If you are an actor, then you are honest. How about this type of statement? Is this could be true or cannot be true? Some actors are not honest. So that statement cannot be the case. And the reason is this. If you're an actor, we know you're honest. So there is no actor out there who is anything other than honest. They are right. all going to be honest. And you can look at that conditional statement along these lines, too. All actors are honest. Perfect. So when you do that, it's really easy to see that some actors are not honest contradicts with that. The same thing would be with most actors are not honest or all actors are not honest. Any of those would contradict that particular statement. Yeah. But it's a lot easier when you see it in the all form of the conditionality as opposed to the if then form of the conditionality. Yeah. And you could take it all the way down to a single Hugh Jackman is not honest. That's not compatible with this. That's not consistent. It's impossible. Don't talk bad about Hugh Jackman. I just said it's impossible. There you That's go. Right. He's honest. <laughs> I picked one that I thought probably was. He's a cool dude, man. Him and Ryan Reynolds have a, dude, I love Hugh Jackman. a special relationship that I appreciate. Yes, That's a bromance anyone can get on board with. Uh, and they can use, keep this in mind too, because it is the LSAT and they play language games. You can use um, synonyms. You can use equivalent phrasings. I doubt they do anything with actor thespian. That's probably a little much. But they could play with the word honest. Hugh Jackman is a liar. That's yep. incompatible with this. They would say that the idea relationship there is clear enough to be common sense, whereas right. with thespian, I don't think they would say that's it's common sense knowledge. Or probably too knowledge. narrow, yeah, too specific. Yeah, I'd agree with you on that. But those are the type of statements that when you get into a cannot be true question, you're looking for direct disagreement right there. And that example, I think, encapsulates that pretty well as to the kind of statements that you would think all right, I need to find something here and then find something that goes right against it For or sure. has an umbrella type of idea that would fit inside what we're talking about. Yeah. What I like about these questions, too, is that the right and the wrong answers begin to immediately categorize or separate themselves in much the same way that must be true, right and wrong answers do. You've got one that's this absolute thing or at least this very well-determined thing, in this case, falsehood, impossibility. And then you tend to have four that are uncertain, Maybe, but I'm not sure. I don't have enough information to know. Must be true questions tend to operate that way as well. So if you can start to figure out what could be true, what's possible but unknowable, you're good here too. That's a wrong answer and, and cannot be true questions. It's a really good point because it's the absolutes in those two questions that are correct. Mm -hmm. The great middle, the possible, the great is middle, the bell curve of uncertainty. That's right. Yeah, well, there's, I mean, again, 80% of the answers are wrong. 
So it's always going to be the great middle of wrongness. Yeah, but the consistency of what makes them wrong is what I particularly enjoy with this question type. I will say this, though, in my experience working with students, as understandable as the idea is behind must be true, Mm -hmm. when you flip it over to cannot be true, it often causes a lot of problems to just accept the upside down nature of what you're doing. Yeah. So this is why I always say think about this beforehand because you don't want to get caught kind of like lazily going through answers and then sliding into a must be true scenario. You need to keep it inside this very tight constraint of you're looking for something that has a direct contradiction. If this doesn't directly contradict or if it's possible or unrelated, then it's incorrect. Yeah. That's a, a tough thing. For some reason, that complete reversal of direction often seems to throw people off in a way that makes it look to me like they just haven't thought about it enough yet. That's, I think that's precisely what it is, or at least a big part of the problem here is that must be true gets so much attention that its opposite doesn't get very much. And so when it happens, of course, it really throws people for a loop at times. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the example we just gave was conditional. And the majority of, I would say, cannot be true questions tend to be conditional in some form. It's really easy to deny a conditional statement. You just say the sufficient doesn't depend on the necessary the way the stimulus says it does. And you're good. They'll do, they'll do quantity stuff too, like numbers and percentages. They do quantities. And they occasionally will break out a principle or like a rule-based type of question, which are also conditional. I know we could both nitpick, but instead of having that strict if then or all um, type of statement that you used or word like only, these are more about behavior sorts of things like guidelines. You know, all mid-sized companies should behave this way. Um, people making this much money should be taxed at X percent. These are conditional, but they tend to have less of that strict feel to them at a glance. But it all really comes down to the idea of I can know things from this, I cannot know things from this, and I can disprove things from this. And that final category is where we live. Those are really just qualified conditional statements, which you've been saying. But when you start thinking about mid-sized companies, it takes your focus away from the conditionality and puts it on the mid-sized company. Right. When you're distracted like that, or at least your attention is focused on one part, it's easy to miss then something going by in an answer choice. Yeah. And so, again, it gets to compatibility. You read an answer about large size companies or, you know, company X is small. That right away is off the table as a right answer because it's going to be compatible. It doesn't it's fit the, the metric, the rubric that you had. Perfect. All right. How do you practice these? Because there's obviously not many out there, but they are important to practice and they have value, both of which I think we should talk about. Okay. Where do you want to start? Let's start with practice and then we'll tell you maybe, and I think again, these are intertwined, uh, that I'm not sure one before the other makes much difference. These are rare questions. So your ability to just pile up a ton of these and run through them one after another is going to be a little bit of a challenge. You can do it. For instance, the training type books that we offer allow this sort of thing. There's an entire chapter just for cannot be true. Both questions are really good. Mm -hmm. That's a joke, by the way. (laughs) Both, yeah. (laughs) All two questions in that chapter. (laughs) There's more than two. But to kind of like underscore this point, there aren't that many. So that means they're (laughs) relatively easy to find. You know, any of your test analytics should list all the question types in each uh, exam that you take. Right. And so whether you have, if you're in a course, then you obviously have access to just segments that are just cannot be true or they're marked out for you. And then the training types do it as well. But even if you're just studying on your own, you can go find all those cannot be true questions. And since there aren't that many It's really interesting to look at them and see some of the similarities that we've been talking about, about the types of stimuli that you run into, the different phrasings that you see in the question stems. But if you're studying and you only have a couple days before the LSAT, I don't know that I would spend six hours collating all the the questions together and going through them. (laughs) But if you're six months out from the LSAT, for sure, go ahead and do that and take a look at them and see how you perform. Because a lot of times I find with students that, hey, they're pretty good, it must be true. And then they look at their cannot be true performance And on an isolated test, it's easy to miss, but over, say, 10, 20 full practice tests, they discover, man, I'm only getting like 20% of these right. Right. Yeah, 20 tests, I had 14 of these, and I missed 
11. Yeah, they didn't realize that they were missing them. And because each time it was unique and it was like, well, that was the only one on that test and it was a hard one. So you can collate them and look at them and see the similarities. And that often will reveal to you, you know, how good you are at doing this when you're under time pressure. Yeah, I suspect most people gearing up for March probably could look back through the most recent tests they've done, however many that is, and pull them out and review them. And that's a good idea, but that's not the only place that cannot be true answer choices at least exist because a lot of must be true questions especially conditional must be true questions tend to have that single answer in there that disagrees it's not just wrong because it's uncertain it's wrong because it's impossible it's an opposite answer as we sometimes call it all that is is cannot be true so anyone listening to this if you can find that opposite answer and must be true congratulations you can do cannot be true because it's identical which is another interesting point from a test making standpoint, because it reveals that had they chosen to, they could have just turned it into a cannot Precisely. be true question. Yeah. And the, the vice versa as well. You could do mm-hmm. cannot be true questions and think, you know what, that would have been a perfect must be true answer. It's their choice as to which direction to take the question. But this is you often see this. Is it a flaw question? Well, maybe we could have made it a weakened question. Well, if we could have made it a weakened question, we could have made it a strengthened question. Right, right, right. And maybe the reasoning was really cool, so maybe it could have been a parallel question. I don't get to be privy to those discussions in <laughs> Newtown, Pennsylvania, and elsewhere, but I imagine there are times when they're like, hmm, we can go different ways with this. This is a great example of that. Precisely. Yeah, I suspect there's probably conversations they have where they've got a a bunch of stimuli and they're looking at it and like, we, we need seven strengthen and we need four weaken. Pick. Because any of those <laughs> questions could easily fall into the, whichever camp you need. I'm not quite sure that it works that way, but... I don't know if it works quite that way, but I'm sure they have certain minimums or certain like frequencies that they try to establish. I think primarily what's occurring is that they're testing so many questions that then they have these statistics that then the computer spits out a model of the section. And so it's it's... Like there's less human input. The human input yeah. is on the question making. It's less so on the test construction. I suppose my point was, do you think these questions are made um, cohesively or as one whole thing? Or do you think that they kind of mix and match pieces? Mix I like that match. stimulus, but it'd be better as a strengthen. I think that's the human element that sometimes right. they get into a question. They're like, this just isn't working as a weekend question. It's either too easy or that something's not clicking for the person who's writing it or the committee that's reviewing it. So they flip it around and they're like, oh, now it's a strength in question. We like yeah. it much more. Well, this is such an easy flaw, but it'd be a better parallel, that kind of thing. Exactly. Or we have that a great was my, answer to That us. was my point. Yeah. I yeah. The they, human element that you're talking about is totally on the up. Uh, on the front end. Yes. After it goes off into the system, I don't think that humans are touching it all that much uh, unless they start to see problems, in which case they're going to fool around with the question and adjust it. Or, right, right, right. You know, which is again, why they use experimental back. sections as well, too. That gives exactly. them very hands-on feedback. You do see some changes sometimes, which are yeah. be interesting. Yeah. You know, I emphasize all of that stuff partly to give you things to practice beyond just the strict nature of cannot be true, but also, I think, to make the point of these questions don't live in a vacuum. Your skill set, your success here, it's not one and done. It ripples out, good and bad. If you're getting better at cannot be true questions, it will make you naturally better at must be true questions. It'll make you better at logic games because it's really the same exercise in just a different form. Exactly. So these questions have got a ton of value peripherally or sort of neighborly, but they can also cause bigger problems than just their frequency might suggest, as I see it. Agreed. For instance, um, Dave, you've used the phrase many times, and I, I still love it, uh, about a question hangover. <laughs> this <laughs> idea of, you know, one question only counts for one point, but it can have much longer lasting negative effects um, if it really rattles you or slows you down too much, costs you too much time or energy or enthusiasm, whatever the case may be. And you can bring it with you if you're not careful. These outlier question types can really be prime contenders to cause that type of hangover. People do this all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, they finish question 18, they start on question 19, and they're like still thinking about the last question. And we talked about this previously, you're now in trouble because you might very well have missed question 18. And now you've compromised yourself on question 19. It's the hangover that gives in a way that you don't (laughs) want it to be giving. That's right. Like all hangovers, very bad. Yeah, there's no fun in this. So Yeah. So know these outlier types, not just for their own value, but because they'll make you better in related questions and because you can avoid the consequences that come from these one-off moments of either supreme difficulty or lingering uh, impact.
Yeah, and the, the final word there is once you finish a question, it's dead to you. If you have problems with it or you're concerned about it, flag it. You can come back to it later. But when you move on to the next question, drop all memory of the prior thing. you got to be unconscious right. about what happened beforehand and get ready for the next shot. Yeah. you got to be so, Russell Westbrook if you're a basketball fan. That's right. Selective amnesia, as I've called it. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's do it. There's uh, another question type and the only other question type that we're really going to dig into here. Um, it is, to me, I, I prefer this one over cannot. But that's largely, I think, just due to the nature that now we get to talk a little more about arguments themselves. And this is a question type uh, even more rare than cannot, if you can believe it. There have been years where this has only happened one time, not just tests, but whole years. It started to make a resurgence. You see this now usually once, maybe twice per test. Uh, June 07 didn't have one, September 14 did. And this is a question type called evaluate the argument. Yeah, truly one of the most unique, probably the single most unique question type in terms of how it's constructed and the formulation of it. For sure. Uh, and I often think about assumptions, both sufficient and necessary assumptions, uh, what we just call regular assumption and justify. Necessary uh, assumption, as some people would call it. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the idea behind those is very unique because you have to go back in time and figure out what the author was thinking when he or she made the argument. Uh, with evaluate the argument, you are tasked with finding the, the pivotal question, the decisive question that will help you determine whether or not the, the argument or whatever is under discussion is strong or weak, which, if you think about it for a second, is an odd task. It's almost like being a committee that's been called in to be like, let me let's evaluate what this person said. We have to come up with a single question that will help us figure out if what they said is good or bad, strong, or more or believable or less believable, more acceptable, less acceptable. Yeah. yeah. And if you're familiar with the kind of the categorizations that we do, we often talk about things like first family questions, which is a must be true based idea where you have questions like must be true. You have method of reasoning and so forth. And it's Flaw, all based on parallel, upon, the rest. Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to list them all, but there are a bunch in there. Probably the biggest of the question types and really the foundation of the LSAT in general, because it's about fact finding. In an evaluate the argument question, you actually have a combination of what we call the second family, which is to strengthen or help. And then the third family, which is to weaken or hurt. And that is because you're asking the right question but you don't necessarily know what the answer is going to be to that question. So it could go that you strengthen the argument or it could work out that your question weakens the argument at that assessment level that you're trying to make isn't determinative by itself. It just leads to a determination of whether it's strong or whether it's weak. Yeah. There's a simultaneity to it or a, a almost duality in terms of what occurs. Yeah, it's an extremely odd task. It's the only type of task like this that you see on, on the test. And I've always been surprised they don't do it more frequently. I know. I, I guess part of me is glad they don't for the average student out there. I think that would really wreck some Saturdays. Um, but I enjoy this. And it's another one of those question types we're going into it, just like cannot could easily be must and vice versa. You get a stimulus here that contains a setup and a structure and an argument that could really lead to anything. It could be weaken or strengthen, which are the two most obvious candidates, but it could be flaw. It could be parallel. It could be lots and lots of different things. Assumption, justify, all of these, anything that's argument based off of questionable or dodgy reasoning could just as easily be evaluated as anything else. Yeah, and you're going back and you're attempting to evaluate the argument, typically. So that's the first thing is, is that you know that an argument has been given. They're tipping you off in the question stem that, hey, there's something up above where someone's trying to make a persuasive statement. So obviously, from an analytical standpoint, you're, you want to know the facts of what was said, but you want to know the structure as well. You want to know what uh, each premise was. You want to know what the conclusion was, what the author's driving at, what's the overall main point. And then you have to come up with that question or statistic or fact, whatever it might actually be, that will help you to analyze what was said. Yeah. Not to give the analysis, but to ask the question that leads to an analysis. And that's where the weirdness of this comes in. Yeah, it's a lens, basically. It's an evaluative tool, not to use the same word uh, in the descriptor, but c conclusion is key. Just like strengthen or weaken, you have to know what the argument is, what the author's trying to convince you of. Like most arguments on this test, you shouldn't be convinced. Not yet. There's a degree of skepticism, a degree of incompleteness that exists here. And the answer choice, once you have an answer to it, 
question, information, whatever, is going to make you more or less convinced. And that's the nature of the right answer. What I love, too, about this question type is that, like some of the other question types in logical reasoning that we discuss, there's a really hard, fast, algorithmic type of test that you can use to measure or to weigh answer choices. You can apply a strong, almost formula to the answers as you go through them. I think we should talk a little bit about this. It's something we call the variance test. One of my favorite tests of all. It's fantastic, and it makes complete sense when you think about it, but most people never do. Well, if you're asking the question in an answer choice that is supposed to lead to an analysis, that could be good or bad for the argument. Yeah. To figure out if you have the central question, what you would really want to sit down and, and determine is, does that give me responses that would either make the argument stronger or weaker? So as I look at each one of the answer choices, what we think about is the range of responses to that answer or that question, geez, that answer is going to tell us whether or not we have something useful. If I give a range of responses to an answer and it doesn't tell me anything or I didn't like, blah, who cares? That's going to be wrong. Whereas if I give a certain range of responses to an answer and in some instances, the answers make me feel like the argument's stronger, and in other instances, it makes me feel like it's weaker, that's going to be the right answer. Yeah. Put another way, when you have the right answer, as your responses to it change, your opinion of the argument should change. That's exactly right. Yeah. That argument now, should sound better and worse as you begin to, and this is the variance test, vary your responses to whatever that answer says. Yeah, your varying of the answers varies your perception of the quality of the argument. That yeah. is the gist, although I think when you say it that way, it doesn't sound like it makes any sense at all. <laughs> well, I agree. This is a very abstract discussion so far. Let's see if we can make it a little more tangible. We're going to make it very tangible in just a minute because we're going to do an actual evaluate question. But before we do, um, I'll see if I can maybe break off an example I use in class sometimes. Part of the difficulty in this, from what I've found in talking to students, is that there seems to be this really amorphous, intangible sense of a conclusion itself, like a belief. A belief feels very ethereal. Ethereal. It's hard to, to kind of get your hands on and touch versus, say, a behavior or a, a choice of action. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to buy that thing. I'm going to avoid that movie. These are, are much more concrete things to choose. They're still conclusions. There are things that are going to either make you want to go see that movie or not and you could begin to list them out as we will. One of the examples I give to try to marry the idea of a conclusion or a belief with ultimately what that belief or conclusion would lead to as a behavior or a action is imagine I'm trying to sell, and Dave, I'll, I'll use you as my guinea pig. Imagine I'm trying to sell you a used car. I know you're not in the market, but imagine I'm trying to sell you one. You are in the market, hypothetically. Okay. Uh, and I'll tell you what the car is. It's a 2008 I don't know, Ford Fiesta. Uh, I'll tell you what it costs. I want 12 grand for it. But that's all the information I'm going to give you. And you have to make a decision, a behavioral decision, about whether or not it's a good idea to buy this car. I'm going to say no. <laughs> probably Ford Fiesta is probably not your style. If it's a 2008 and you're asking $12,000, it's like what they're worth. probably overpriced. $5,000. But probably you don't know for sure because, again, there are still factors that are unknown in this equation. And that's really what this is. These are the variables that you'd want to turn from an X to a number, so to speak. Think of the things as you begin to run down like a hierarchy of concerns or considerations for the average used car buyer out there, things they'd want to know. And anyone who's listening to this could probably start to already make some hierarchical list in their minds. How which many probably miles? Wonder, what's that? How many miles? Is How many miles? Out? Why does that matter more than, say, you know, tire pressure? Wear and tear. And Precisely. Also, the and the way is. you can test it, let's really apply this test in a hard way, the variance test. What if that car has 10 miles on it? You know, like, it's basically brand new. Nice what if I'm like, it's got 600,000 miles on it. Grandma drove a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Suddenly, that car is probably beat to death. <laughs> Told you it was overpriced. That's right. Things like, again, does it start when you turn the key? These are important considerations. <laughs> it does start. Okay. It does. Might okay. be worth it. It doesn't. Hang on. Definitely Has it ever been in an it. accident? It's been in seven. <laughs> it nope. must have been your car then. That's right. <laughs> jerk. <laughs> it's been in zero. It's been garage kept to maintain this. The owner babied it. These are the things that would matter. And again, you can start to, to really see where this is consequential versus not as you introduce ideas that maybe don't matter. Like what are the radio presets? 
you know what, it's all classic rock, or it's a mix of country and rap, or whatever. The, these things don't matter so much. What side is the gas cap on, left or right? Driver's oh, side for the win. Right. <laughs> I agree with you, by the way. But that's probably not going to be the make or break factor. And this is what wrong answers and evaluate do. They introduce concerns that no matter what angle you come at them from, yes or no, all or nothing, left or right, doesn't change the overall decision or, in the case of a conclusion, your belief in it, your opinion of it. True. And the interesting thing about that example, which I think is an utterly killer example, is that as you look at the questions that are most relevant, they're much bigger picture issues mm -hmm. that affect the car and its integrity as a whole, the number of miles, the number of accidents. These types of things are about the, the wholesale aspect of the car. Whereas the questions that are less important, where's the gas cap? <laughs> These tend to be very minor peripheral details that aren't central to the entirety of the car. Yeah. So the scope of the questions that we're asking to evaluate this are related to the magnitude of the idea, which is you're talking about whether you're buying the whole thing or not. Yeah, I'll add a point to that, too, because it's a really good one. These are objective measures. These are things that undeniably make it a better or worse, in this case, decision to buy the car. The test deals in objective measures. It does not deal in subjectivity. You'll notice that one of the questions I didn't bring up but can would be like, what color is it? There are some people who are just like, that car is lime green. I don't care how good a deal it is. I'm not touching it. But for most people, color is a far lower consideration and a very personal one. The LSAT doesn't deal in personal opinions. If you're like, I have to have a red car, I don't care what it is. That's not an LSAT scenario. Hmm. Red cars get more tickets. Yeah, I've heard that. They're also safer though, right? <laughs> the paint wards off accidents. Uh, they're saying? more visible. I gotcha. That's a real See, statistic. See, the paint wards off accidents. There you go. That's a real statistic. <laughs> so again, this is it, that example is obviously a singular, very real world sort of situation. But the overall application of that test, the variance test, where you're really trying to measure things in a concrete fashion, not like I prefer black, I prefer blue, but does it have 1,000 miles or does it have 100,000 miles? These are the things that the test concerns itself with. And the easiest way, I think, to determine answer choices is to take them to those real extremes. No miles, a million miles. Would that change your opinion about this purchase? If it would, then that's a good question to ask. Yeah, that's a good example of a right answer. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at one of these questions. Let's do it. Um, the way I'm going to go through this question, this is taken from, if you want to pull this up, the good news is this is free to pull up. This is right from LSAX, and we'll link to it. Um, their very own self-distributed digital test preview interface. Um, so if you go to the logical reasoning section there, there's only one section. This is question number six. It comes from the September 2014 LSAT. This is the second logical reasoning section there, so LR2. And again, question number six. We'll put a link to it. So if you want to pause this and pull that up, you can read through this with me. If you're listening to this on a commute or in your car or something, please don't try to pull the question up. Yeah, and this is a question that I believe they also give away for free in the Khan Academy. Yes, software I think it's that they part have. of the, that so. as well. So this is free all over the place if you want to go find it. And with that in mind, I'm going to read through. I'm going to read top to bottom so you can at least just hear the question in full, and then we'll start to break it down the way we typically do and have done in the past with things like parallel. So here we go. This is question six, and it tells us this is a clinician. And here's what we're told. It says that patients with immune system disorders are usually treated with a class of drugs that, unfortunately, increase the patient's risk of developing osteoporosis, which is a bone loss disease. So, it says, these patients take another drug that helps to preserve existing bone. Since a drug that enhances the growth of new bone cells has now become available, these patients should take this new drug in addition to the drug that helps to preserve existing bone. So there's the stimulus. Question stem. Which one of the following would be most useful to know in order to evaluate the clinician's argument? Classic evaluate question stem. And just very quickly, A through E, I'll read down through. Here's A. How large is the class of drugs that increase the risk of developing osteoporosis? B. Why are immune system disorders treated with drugs that increase the risk of developing osteoporosis? C. Is the new drug more expensive than the drug that helps to preserve existing bone. D, how long has the drug that helps to preserve existing bone been in use? And E, to what extent 
does the new drug retain its efficacy when used in combination with the other drugs? So there's your five answers. Now, again, that's a lot to process just top to bottom all the way through. I don't expect anyone's like, oh, clearly the answer is. So <laughs> maybe you did. Um, but assuming you didn't, let's break this thing down a little bit. The stimulus is really comprised of three parts, this clinician. The first thing we're told is background, really. Patients, people with this immune system disorder, they're treated with a class of drugs, so maybe a whole drug regimen, um, but unfortunately there's a side effect. It increases their risk of developing this bone loss disease called osteoporosis. If you don't know what osteoporosis is, some people probably don't, they define it. It's just a disease that causes you to lose bone mass, which is not a good thing. So what do you do to counteract this, to combat it? Typically these patients take another drug, whatever it is, that helps to preserve existing bone. So it's kind of a stop. It's a, it's a pause button, so to speak. Whatever bone you've got, this drug can help to maintain or preserve it. But here's the good news, and this is the conclusion down at the end. They found a new drug, a third piece now, and it not only preserves or whatever they say, but helps to enhance, so this is even better, the growth of new bone, uh, and that's now available. And so the conclusion itself is that people who take this new drug, the bone growth drug, they should do that in addition to the drug that helps to preserve it, which is what they already do. So we've got this rogue element, this new thing. We know they're already taking old drugs that lead to bone loss. We know they're typically taking drugs that preserve or prevent more bone loss. But there's a third thing now that they're encouraged to add to this regimen that not only helps to preserve, it helps to now grow bone, repair bone, get more of it. The question is, as we look at this exact conclusion, should they take this new drug in addition to the same drugs they've been taking? What would we want to know about this new drug? in order to decide if that's a good idea or a bad one. So in a way, this is behavioral. This is not just a conclusion about belief. This is actual choice of behavior. Should these people take this new drug that helps to grow bone or not? That's what I want to know. And the way I can test these answers to help determine that as a yes or a no type of thing, a good or bad idea, is to vary my responses to them. So let's bang through these answers one at a time. We'll consider them, we'll go to the opposite extremes, and we'll see if that makes the new drug seem like a good idea or maybe not. That's my goal here. That's my prephrase. Here's A. How large is the class of drugs that increase the risk of developing osteoporosis? In other words, how many drugs do they take currently to help with this immune disorder that they have? Does that matter? Let's say they take 100 pills a day. Would that have any impact on whether they should take this new drug to help grow bone? If you're not sure, that's a really good sign it's not the right answer. Remember, both answers need to have an impact. Yeah, and you can also interpret this answer to be along the lines of, like, how many drugs are within this Precisely. grouping of drugs. Yeah. And it, they take 100 of one drug? Do they take 100 different drugs, a pill each? Or are there 100 different drugs that do this exact kind of thing? Sure. And it won't make a difference. If you say the class is large... It has no effect. If you say the class is very small and there's only one, it yeah. has no effect at all there. Yeah. Whether you take this as the volume, whether you take this as the number of options, Cialis, Viagra, it doesn't matter. The question is, does it matter how many there are or not? And again, if you can tell on even one of those two extremes that it's not going to matter, the answer's out. That to me is a secondary part of this test that I love, is that you don't have to necessarily establish that both are irrelevant. If even one is, that's the end of the line for that answer. Half wrong is all wrong. Half wrong is all wrong. Exactly right, Dave. So A is out. It doesn't matter, large or small, how many drugs there are. What about B? Let's go to that. Why are immune system disorders treated with drugs that lead to osteoporosis or increase your risk? Let's come up with different reasons. And if those reasons, as we change them, don't impact whether they should take this new drug, again, this answer goes away right away. They're treated because there's no other way to do it. They're treated because it's the cheapest option. They're treated because that's what people want to do. It's convenient. Would any of those tell you that this new drug was a better or a worse idea than this doctor, this clinician thinks? The answer is no. It doesn't matter why they do this. The question is what this new drug is going to do in addition to what they're already doing. Help, hurt, what? So just like A, our answers don't change our opinion of the conclusion here for B. It goes away. Let's jump to C. Is this new drug more expensive than the drug they currently take to preserve bone? Again, vary your answers. What could you say about being more expensive? It either is or it isn't, yes or no. It's way more expensive. It's a million dollars a dose. Would that tell you whether they should take it or not? Remember, this isn't saying whether they can, whether they will. It's whether they should. What if it's cheaper? What if it's way cheaper? What if it's free? 
What if the doctor will pay you to take it? <laughs> Would that change whether it's a good idea to take this drug in addition to what they're already doing? And once again, the price doesn't matter. Whether they should do it has to do with efficacy, has to do with impact. So we've got to move on to D. A, B, and C, the variance test doesn't give us any change in our opinion of the exact conclusion. D, how long has the drug that helps to preserve existing bone been in use? Remember, that's the middle piece in this. This is the one they already take that just preserves bone. It doesn't grow it. It just keeps them where they are. How long has it been in use? What if it's been a week? That's the low end of this. What if it just came out yesterday? What if it's been in use for decades, since the 50s? Would that have any impact, once again, on whether they should take another drug that helps to grow bone in addition to it? Again, the extent, the longevity of this doesn't matter. It has no impact on this exact conclusion. So just like strengthen and weaken, it all comes back to what the final belief is here. What's the conclusion itself? Should they take the new drug or not? How long the current drugs have been around has no bearing. So we've either made a grave mistake <laughs> or we're home with E. Let's see what E says. That doesn't mean I become more eager to accept E. It just means that E is our last option before we have to reconsider something else. Here's E. To what extent does the new drug retain its efficacy, in other words, its effectiveness, when used in combination with the other drugs? I may have given this away a little bit by using the word efficacy before, but here we are. It's E. It was given away anyway. To what extent does it retain its effectiveness? To what extent does it work? when you actually combine it with the other drugs in play here? Again, vary your answer. It gets even better. It's 100% effective when you combine it with these other drugs. Great. Give me some. Let's take it. Where's the harm? Go the other way. It completely loses all effectiveness when you combine it with these other drugs. In other words, as soon as you combine it, it does nothing good for you anymore. It doesn't grow bone at all. Should you still take it? Of course not. What's the point? Notice how with E, as we vary our answer, we get diametrically opposed opinions on whether this conclusion seems like a good idea or a bad one. Not a proven conclusion or a disproven one, but really just good or bad, or in the case of this, very good and very bad, as we vary our answers. So that's the way I see this question breaking down. That's the way I see these answer choices ultimately falling victim to and then finally rewarding us based on the variance test. Dave, do you have anything to add to that? I do have a couple things to add, do not it. surprisingly. <laughs> Never. Okay. So what John just did there was he said, let's talk about this kind of challenging technique that is really decisive. And let's take a look at every answer choice and apply the technique to it to kind of reveal how it works and why four of these answers are really irrelevant. And then the correct answer shows you exactly how switching answers or varying your responses uh, proves that this is the correct answer. John, would you do that in that exact same way if this was the, the real LSAT that you were no, taking? No, and I'm really glad you brought this up. It reminds me a little bit of when we talked about the parallel reasoning elemental attack. We analyzed each of the pieces there, but it was really kind of a flying survey, as it were. Here, if I can see an answer choice immediately is going to be irrelevant, I don't have to start testing these in these very like predetermined, um, very clinical kinds of ways. As soon as I see like how large is the class of drug, all right, that doesn't matter. This conclusion is about taking the new drug or not. Why are they treated with drugs that do this harm? Uh, that has nothing to do with whether they should take the new drug. Just that quick. As fast exactly. as I can. Exactly. And, and so, to me, the, this test, kind of like assumption negation, too, is I think most applicable, or at least most rewarding and valuable, when you really get it down to a point of indecision. That's exactly right. And interestingly enough, that was the point that I was going to kind of roll to. Sorry. Is that <laughs> when you look at certain questions that have almost like prove it, disprove it type of tests, uh, evaluate the argument is certainly one of them. Uh, assumption negation is another. The agree-disagree test in pointed issue uh, mm. questions is, is another one that you can use. That's not the main method of attack. What that is is a cleanup tool. It's a confirmation or a final separator. So when you look at something like this, as John pointed out, as I'm going through the answers, I would probably say to myself that first one is like, how large is the class of drugs? If I think that's relevant, I would probably just hold on to it. If I don't think it's relevant, I knock it out as a loser and I move on to the next answer. Oh, you know, why do they, you know, do this with the this class of drugs and right. this symptom? Well, if I think it's relevant, again, I'll hold on to it and so forth. The third one is about expense. 
The fourth is about how long it's been in use. In each one of those things, I'm thinking to myself, is this a relevant issue here? If I don't think it's relevant, I just throw it out. Now, if I get down to two answers and I'm trying to separate the two, that's when I can start pulling something like this in. So you're not using this on all five answer choices. You're only using it when you need it. And that could be either to separate between two contenders or let's say you got down to E and you're like, he's the only one that sounds reasonable, but you weren't totally sure. That would be a perfect spot to say, well, let me check it really quick. Yeah. Oh, it has, it works even better. It doesn't work at all. Wow. E is the right answer because varying the answers gave me a different view of the argument in the stimulus. That same thing is true with the other question types we were just talking about. So assumption questions as well as uh, pointed issue questions. I'm not using something like assumption negation on every answer. And if you are, you are making a mistake. Yeah. And I'm, I'll, I'll say it bluntly, not meanly, <laughs> but I'll say it bluntly. You have misunderstood the advisement that we have been giving. Those are for the end game of finishing off a question where you're down to one or two answers and you either need to prove it to yourself or you need to knock out or confirm another answer choice. Don't apply any of these techniques to all five. This is slightly different than the elemental attack, but that's because you're flying in various pieces. So it's something, it's a right. point I always like to make whenever I talk about these. These are incredibly powerful. They are very rare questions because you get the opportunity to actually double check it mm -hmm. with a completely different view than just your thoughts on the matter. You have a tool that allows you to separate answers into the right or the wrong category. Pull it out at the right time. It's fantastic. If you're pulling it out on every one of the answer choices, you're making a mistake. Yeah. I like your in-game reference there. It's a real Marvel kind of night we're having. <laughs> I knew that was coming. It's fantastic. Of course it was coming. How could I miss it? Um, you're right. So the way I kind of describe these tests is you need to have the ability to apply them to any answer choice, but you don't want to have to on the test. You need to get past that phase. I do it here simply to show the technique at work. Which is perfect. Yeah. This is, this is, this is to display how it works yeah. in, in theory and in practice, not how we would do the question itself. It's to show the idea and the technique at work. And if you can do it on five answers, I'll do it on all five to show it. Not during the test, though. Yeah, I think that's a perfectly good point. Um, it's easy to get bogged down in these techniques because they are so powerful. Uh, you can get enamored with the, the reveal that they provide, but it's, it's too much to do five times. So we talk a little bit about this as a question type. Um, obviously because tonight's about outliers and black sheep, but also because, as Dave just said, you really get kind of double the bang for your buck in these questions. When we looked at E and began to vary our stance on it, as it were, we could see a strengthen and a weaken happen at the same time. As we changed our respective position on E, we saw that it could help and it could hurt. So just like cannot be true can make you better at things like logic games, can make you better at things like wrong answers, and must be true. Evaluate the argument questions will inevitably make you better at both strengthen and weaken as you do more of these and hopefully vice versa. And that's a really good place to practice these. Any strengthen or weaken question for the most part could easily be an evaluate. Consider the opposite of that answer choice and see what effect it might have. Yeah, it's actually a perfect way to think about those. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get to the heart of the issue. What's the central issue that you could ask about? Well, if you can identify that, it'll make you better at strengthen and weaken. Yeah. So doing that in strengthen and weaken will make you better with these questions. Yeah, Very I cool. think of it in terms of like vulnerability a lot of times. Where's the chink in this armor? If we're going to weaken, we want to exploit it. If we're going to strengthen, it'd be really nice to sew it up. Evaluate just gets in there and moves in both directions. Agreed. Anything further to add? No, no, I'm glad we got a chance to do this. I hope anyone out there listening understands where exactly this should fall um, in the overall scope of the remaining time. If you feel like, you know what, logical reasoning is good, but I am a little worried about things I haven't spent much time with. Welcome to this episode. If you're like, <laughs> what in the world is a strength in question? <laughs> Well, if that's what your question is, you were in yeah. much bigger trouble than, yeah. uh, you know, the LSAT being in Turn this off right here. now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, Sign up when you. you look at the various types of questions that show up rarely, and, you know, we'll do another episode on pointed issue and point of agreement because yeah, they're so like close, this. but they fall into this category to some extent. 
go back and familiarize yourself with them. If our discussion of evaluate was like, I kind of remember this, go back and read <laughs> up a little bit on it and make sure that when and if and when you see one on the test, it doesn't just blow your mind and knock you off path completely. Yeah, that's exactly All right. right. Well, we hope that you enjoyed listening to our discussion of the LR outliers and black sheep. And if you have any questions about this episode, please feel free to send us a message. You can send that to LSAT at powerscore.com or LSAT podcast at powerscore.com. Also, if you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube and rate us as well. We would really appreciate that. Thanks so much. And John, I'm about to head to the casino, man. Uh, well, I'm going to go get another Guinness. Have a good night, buddy. Good luck. Win me Thanks. some money. All right. Later. Later. Later.